Right then, Mike, obviously I had a little flick through your book last night and I was aware you'd caught it anyway, but being as you described it in your book as the pinnacle of your carp fishing career, um, it would be amazing to hear your story of Colmere. Colmere and the Black Mirror, yeah? Okay. So, where do we want to start? You lead the way. Um, <laughs> well, where did you first set eyes on the lake or hear about the lake? Well, um, the first time I set foot on the place was 1999. Uh, obviously, I'd heard about it before then. I was fishing Raysbury in the early 90s, and I'd heard about the mere, but I, I, you know, I hardly had time to fish Raysbury. I was a postman at the time, so I, you know, I could only fish sort of one or two nights a week, which is still quite a lot. But when you're coming from Somerset, and then the expenses of that, and uh, you know early kind of days well the bait company essential had been running for probably sort of 10 years at that time i suppose so i was putting a lot of effort into that so i couldn't really shirk them responsibilities family as well so i'd heard about it but i i, I hardly had the fish time to fish raysbury let alone the mere so uh so fast forward then to 99 i started to take a bit of a closer interest and i went up there one sort of it was a lovely sort of late spring day and I thought it was a great time to travel down there. And I asked my son, Lee, if he wants to come down. And he said, yeah, I'll come up there with your dad, you know. And we spent the day just walking around there. And, you know, everything I'd heard about the place, it was all overgrown and a complete sort of jungle was correct, you know, and true. It was like, you know, you, you, you know any, anyone like listening to this, it's not like a normal lake where you can put your stuff on a barrel and go round. I mean, half a time, one bank was almost impenetrable. And if you didn't get to the end of that bank without sort of like blood all over you, you know, you had to wear the right clothing and cuts and scrapes, you know, you, you were doing something wrong sort of thing. It was, you know, under brambles and out, trees that had fallen down um, that you'd have to sort of like burrow under and get out the other side. But that was all part of it on the mirror. That was part of the game. It was all, you know, that clandestine type of approach because you're not supposed to be there and... So anyway, me and Lee went there and uh, we started having a look around and uh, they, we found someone fishing sort of tucked away with all camo netting up over the other side. And then we walked along what they call the high bank. And uh, you, you, you were allowed to be around there. It wasn't sort of, but you, obviously it was illegal to fish there. Now you had sort of bird watchers and the like, you know, that we walk, we'd walking around the bank with their tripods taking, you know, shots of the birds. Anyway, me and Lee had sort of made our way around what they call the high bank and then sort of down the slope and into a, a very small sort of little peninsula, if you like, that jutted out that was called the Southwest Point. And when, we're, when we were on there, um, we happened to look across the lake, across to a, a swim called the Rat Hole, which will become quite significant later on, because that was an area there where the Black Mirror used to frequent quite a lot. And all of a sudden, we looked across the lake, and, and it was a flat, calm lake, but it was almost like someone had launched a torpedo at us. You know, it was this just big black, black sort of shoulders, like, but it was heading straight towards us. It was an awake, it was leaving the bow waves. And so I said to Lee, and there was a big overhanging willow over the lake at this point. I said, quick, let's get up the tree. So we both sort of like hurriedly climbed up this tree. And when we've got to sort of like, you know, a good height above the water, by then it was still probably 30, 40 yards away. And it came in and it sort of just come under the tree. And there was no mistaking what fish it was. Not that I'd seen it before, but just the length of it and the colour of it. And it sort of just turned when we was over the brow with the bow of the tree and just came right out of the water, right underneath us both and just like fell over to its side. You could just see all the scales and everything about it. And, and it was just incredible like moment if you like and the old heart stopped and I thought at that and it just turned round and swam back out again it was almost like it's almost like it come over to say hello catch you know? me if you can yeah absolutely and and I and it was just a, one of those sort of most memorable moments in my carp fishing career if you like because you know so anyway I said to Lee and that was my first encounter with the mirror with coal mirror and also the black mirror of course and I couldn't believe how lucky I was to see it on my first trip there I wasn't fishing obviously that was just for a walk around and I it was like real buzzing and I remember saying to Lee I'll tell you what if there's, I'm going to catch that no matter what I've kind of like made up my mind there and then that I was going to catch that fish one day albeit I wasn't it, I was several years away from really putting in the time because I still didn't have the time I was still like you know trying to build the bait business do it you know working part so um 
Anyway, we left then, uh, we had another look around just to sort of find out a bit more about it. But, you know, people that have read my book, Carp Life 2, would, may remember that sketch where we're up, me and Lee's up the tree, Craig Stanard, my artist, are drawn that, where it had come right out. So that was my most memorable encounter was, was, was then, but that was right back in 1999. I visited it again a couple of months later, fun enough, with Lee uh, for another walk round. So I kind of just wanted to stay in tune with the place, but... I decided that I wasn't ready for fishing it yet. You know, there was other places I was fishing and, uh, you know, obviously Frampton, there was the Park Lake at Swindon, Coke Water Park and other places. Yeah. And also, you know, it was a big old challenge, the, the, the Black Mirror. You know, I knew it was going to take uh, a lot of time and effort to, to, to even sort of pit my wits against something like that. Uh, and travelling from Somerset, you know, it's like a 320 mile round trip. So it wasn't easy in that respect. So... But come 2005, I was pretty much ready to give it a go. And I guess that's the first year that I started fishing for it, like with any, where I could put in a little bit of time. You know, I, I, I could get down there sort of once a week or every other week and try and put in a couple of nights. Sometimes I'd string three nights together. So it was 2005 was, the, was when I really started fishing for it. And um, at the time, uh, it was on, the, I mean, I was, I was very friendly with John McAllister, Johnny Mack. And he was fishing for it. I think that's the year he caught it, actually, in 2005. Because I remember getting all my kit ready to go down there and start my campaign when he caught it. And I'm glad, obviously, for John, because we were good mates. But John had been on, the, on and off there for a couple of years or so. Uh, but he was using my bait. And, you know, John would fill me with information about... And he was using my B5, the shellfish B5. And he used to tell me stories about how much they liked it on there. And that was a big... Um, bonus to me uh, you know confidence boost because you know you've heard so many stories on the mirror over the years that they don't eat boilies or there's so much natural in there they're very selective over what they eat so straight away I had that sort of confidence boost I knew what I was going to use I'd still have my sort of bit of tiger nut approach and corn and all the rest of it um, but uh, yeah so 2005 I started fishing it um, yeah and uh, on there at that time there was a, another lad called Dave Sloan uh, commonly uh, often referred to as Beadle um, and then god you know I'm, tr I'm stretching my memory back then uh, there, there weren't many of us on it um, probably the first guy I really got to know on there was a guy called uh, I, know, I always called him Ar Army Jim James or Jim James Mockridge and he was a like a lovely guy you know he was in the army hence army gym obviously and he used to fish Yately and a few other lakes and but he was a real down-to-earth guy you know real salt of the earth and i'd have to say that he helped me a lot in them them early years because he disclosed and you know with a lot of confidential information with me backwards and forwards in emails and things and you know i couldn't really thank him enough for the help he gave me about certain things that were going on there like raids and stuff like that so, you know, Jim was a big help and, you know, he was fishing as well on and off and co often I'd go down there and like, you know, you'd hear the twigs sort of snapping and breaking as you walked along and it'd be Jim and we'd have our chats. Um, so yeah, 2005 was when I started fishing it. Uh, the, probably the closest guy I got to that year fishing it at the same time was who I mentioned earlier, Dave Slow and Beadle. We both kind of like kept in touch and fished it together, if you like. And I think it was, it was him that that was my first encounter of, of of a carp not not first encounter but the first chance i had was late august 2005 and there was a low big low pressure coming in it had been blowing northerly for a few weeks we'd had all these sort of quite chilly summer northerlies that you get and all of a sudden the forecast was for a quite a big southerly coming in pressures would drop in and i knew that i had to get on the end of it or at least somewhere in that vicinity so there's a swim there called the turds Lovely name for a swim, the turds, for obvious reasons, like, you know. Um, and, um, yeah, you had to watch where you were stepping half the time in there. I think the bird watchers used to go in there quite a lot. So, anyway, but the thing is, it faces you down a lake, and when there's a southerly wind, it puts you right in the teeth of it. And I got there, and literally I was only there five or ten minutes, and Beadle turned up all disappointed because he, he wanted that swim as well. So he said, oh, do you mind if I fish just at the bank? And I said, no, you carry on. And, uh, yeah, we, we, we fished that night and uh, I just dropped one in front of me in the margins just down to the right and just flicked out two rods. 
we wasn't both of us at this stage were really apprehensive about about the place you know because when you step on you hear all these rumors about it being raided and stuff like that so you was like you know what i mean you was really conscientious about getting caught the turds was quite a good place because it was just off that beaten track of where the bird watchers go so you felt a little bit safer there in the woods for the want of a better word in the woods and I forget that night, um, I'd, done, we'd done, I'd done a couple of nights on there that session, and as I say, ended up in that swim. And it must have been, so me and Beda was up all night talking about this and that, and what if you caught the Black Mirror, and then we're talking about the history of it and the place and all the rest of it. And it must have been, it, it, it'd gone down, I was in one of these little sort of action man tents that you pick up from Argos, which are about sort of 12 quid. They're really for kids in their back garden, you know, little sort of things. That, but because you, you couldn't hardly have any kit you couldn't carry it was so impenetrable the bank side you couldn't carry around much kit and i remember being in there sort of you know not really sort of it was only about sort of five foot long so i'm all cramped up in there and it i don't know what time it was probably two o'clock in the morning when an absolutely ham humdinger of a run just a one noter and i've come running out the old heart was going boom 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 beetles beetles come running out so, so it's my right hand rod fished down in the margin so i've pulled into it and it's like i remember at first thinking it doesn't feel very big it's like it must be a tench because it was like head was knocking a bit but as it got a bit closer i could tell it wasn't a tench and beetle got the net and after a while slipped it in the net lovely short fat common um i was just chuffed to catch my first carp of the, from the mere uh weighed it up 26 pound two ounces i couldn't believe that i had done three nights fishing and on the third night I've caught a mere carp. Just unbelievable because this, you know, it's like 40 acres in size thereabouts, getting on for 40 acres with, I think, 17, as 17 known carp in there. So to have a carp on my third night, I was like over the moon. And uh, yeah, so we just sort of, you know, done a few pickies and yeah, that was the fir my first real encounter with it, yeah. Very nice, mm. nice, yeah. So then... Where do we go from there? Well, I was keen to get back, as you can imagine. <laughs> I mean, that there was no more fish there, and it was, I was keen to get back. And um, bait up before you left? Uh, yeah, I was always putting bait in, but I was putting it in areas that you know, at that, it was such early stages. I hadn't really worked out any real decent spots. I mean, I'd been out in the boat, a few sneaky missions out in the boat to find a few areas. Found the, the sort of bars and plateaus in front of the. Um, out from the South Wesley Point and, and the rat hole, that area, you know, which was a good spot and where the Black Mirror had been caught from a few times. Um, and, um, but I was always trickling a bit of bait in the margins and snags and stuff like that. And, you know, you're just hoping that, you know, they're going to get used to feeding on your bait and what have you. And because John had been fishing it for a couple of years, so they'd already seen the bait and I know they were eating it. Um, so I was keen to get back and I, I think it may have been the next session, so I've done three nights, four or five, I'd probably come back for a sort of two nighter and then I come back again after, after that and uh, again, and by the time I come back, the, the, the thing is with a mirror, the water used to turn really green and algified and I come back and it was like thick green algae all over which was a real pain because, you you know, climbing the trees and you couldn't see the fish and all the rest of it. You see any bait, um, if your bait had gone in the edge. Yeah, and... you couldn't, know, you know, the baited sp the spots that I put in, I didn't know if it was still there, although this was a few weeks on, but like, so anyway, I've got back and had a walk around and I decided to get up a tree where the sort of algal scum didn't really, you know, because a lot of it would catch on the edge of the branches of the tree. So there were some areas that where it was a little bit clearer. And I got up a tree on the South Wesley Point and I'd just seen the back end of a, of a mirror coming out of the weed canopy and turning round. And I, it was a mirror, which is rare, because as far as we know, there was only two mirrors in there, which was the black mirror and one that we used to call, it's had different names over the years. I think some people call it the dumpy mirror. During our time, we used to call it the twitchy mirror. And um, that's which, what fish it was, because it obviously wasn't the black mirror. It was, it was sort of mid upper 20, something like that. But we knew that it used to hang around with a black mirror, so I thought, well, that's as good a place to start as anywhere there, like, you know. So what I decided to do is fish there for the night. Beadle was up on back visiting the turd swim, back another sort of 100 yards behind me. And anyway, uh, that night, so I plopped a couple of rods out quite close, not too far, and I just PVA bags, like just to bomb through the algal scum, if you like, a bit of... Um, foam on the hook you know sort of popped up through the scums you know where it was just a little bit trickle of bait round them and what have you got back 
set the rod, set the rod, you know, hid the rods as best you can, hid in the undergrowth because you know you again it's quite close to the bird watchers' path, so I was paranoid. So most of the time you were just sort of put in a, a, some sort of ground sheet on the floor and, and sleeping under a hedge or something like that. And it was Feral. like, yeah, it was hard work because like there's all sorts of stuff. I mean, the red ants there were just un un unbelievable. Um, just like, and they bite, bite like fuck as well, didn't they? The red ants and the midges and it was horrible. It was, but you had to do it. Like, you know, there's no, you couldn't sort of, we, certainly at that time, we didn't have the, the, the bottle, if you like, to put up a bivy and stuff like that because we just wanted to find out a little bit about, about the place. Anyway, I remember, I remember actually that night, it was quite a misty, murky night, uh, not good fishing conditions at all, sort of like just like mist coming out and murky, almost foggy. But I do remember thinking all through the night, it, the lake was alive with like smaller fish, like splish, splosh, like really sort of strange, uh, you know, just splish, splosh, but really active, the smaller fish, you know, your tench, your, your roach, your rad, and, and probably the odd pike strike in the morning and what have you. And then... It, it, I don't know what time it was. I was just sort of getting up and having a morning brew. And all of a sudden, one of my rods melted off. And I'm in. My right hand rod, actually. that was only fishing probably one and a half rod lengths. So I've gone round and I've pulled into it. And I'm in again. Now, you know, so I, think, I couldn't believe it. Um, anyway, after a good scrap, that's a net. It's in there. Lovely common. Real sort of long golden common. The one they call the blind eye common. One of his eyes is black. Some people call it twisty common because it's got a slightly twisted shape to it. And again, I, you know, from what John had told me the previous year, the couple of fish that used to swim with a black mirror with a, with a twitchy, sorry, with a black mirror with a, the twitchy mirror, which I'd seen the day before, and blind eye, the, the common that I just caught. Anyway, 29 pound, I think it was 29 pound three. And it was on my seventh night. So I'm thinking, hang on, I fished seven nights on the mirror and had three carp. So I was like over the moon. I thought, oh my God, if I keep going at this rate, um, you know, it ain't going to be long before I catch the black mirror. Then it's just punch your chance, isn't it really? It's just a lottery what, what fish comes along. But obviously you make your own luck over, as you go on on your journey because, you know, you, you, you work out areas that it frequents and what have you. Um, so, yeah, I was just happy with that. And um, I visited it a few more times that year, didn't have any more fish. And before we'd know, winter was over, you know, winter arrived, should I say, and that was the end of 2005. So, but I'd learned a lot. And like I always said to like everyone and my mates and my family at the time that I kind of, when I started fishing for the Black Mirror at the Mirror, I kind of wanted to taste, I wanted to, I wanted to get bit to fuck. Do you know what I mean? I wanted to taste the ambience of the mirror. I, I didn't want the Black Mirror to be my first fish or anything like that. I wanted to catch a few of its fish. I really wanted to feel that when I caught the fish, that I really deserved it. I don't know. I just, just a thing that a bit of like sadistic punishment, if you like, <laughs> but I always wanted to sort of, you know, go on the journey of the mirror after all I'd heard about it and all the books you'd read about it and everyone's tales I wanted to sort of like encompass that and feel the ambience of it so I was more than happy that first year going up there say half a dozen times catching a couple of fish and and that was it really for that year 2005 that uh, winter came in and you know that was it really so I mean it must have been itching to get back the following spring then yeah, yeah, 2006. I actually visited a couple of times in the winter. Uh, and yeah, it's a completely different place in the winter, as you can imagine, because all the leaves from the trees are gone and it's really barren and there's nowhere to hide. It's a big old lonely place, you know, and I didn't see anyone there in the winter at all other than the, the, bird, the twitchers, you know, the bird watchers and things. So you couldn't sort of like bivy, even on the other side, on the high lagoon bank, it was really dangerous because the old bird watchers would be up on the high bank with the old high powered you know, and, and uh, yeah, it was just too dodgy. I mean, no one really knew. The thing is at the mere, there was an awful lot of skullduggery. I say skullduggery goes on that you had to kind of, obviously you was pitting your wits against the fish, but you was also, there was a lot of blinds being thrown, you know, the black mirror's dead, uh, the, the mirror's been raided, and then you, and finding out whether it had been raided and, and whether it wasn't, or whether it was bullshit, and whether the fish was dead or alive, because, you know, understandably, anyone that was fishing for the Black Mirror didn't really want anyone else on there, or at least as minimal as possible. So all these blinds would be thrown about. But I went back, started fishing it in the spring of 2006. Went back there, 
Beadle was there, uh, you know, obviously Army Jim was on and off there, Alan Welsh was on and off there, Mad Martin, guy called Mad Martin, uh, Lee Watson, uh, Simon Bater, uh, met Simon a few times, good lad Simon, like Simon, and uh, bumped into him a few times. And yeah, just you, I kept myself to myself, really. And um, So did you leave your gear stashed up there throughout the winter then? Yeah, a lot of it. Yeah, a lot of it, because you, you couldn't, I, I, I was getting like old stuff, like old bed chairs. I mean, at that time, I probably had about three bed chairs in different areas around the lake, you know, all in like waterproof covers tucked away. And the thing is, all of us on there, uh, obviously there was another guy, Dr. Nick Pete was on there. I've probably forgotten a few, but it's hard. It's going back a lot of years now, a fair few years, but everyone had gear stashed there, but everyone was respectful. There was a few sort of, there was a few sort of uh, uh, rogues, if you like. There was a bit of kit went missing now and again. But, you know, if I, if I um, you know, Steve Briggs was on there, for example. But if I, everyone knew where each other's kit was stashed and you just wouldn't touch it. Do you know what I mean? It was like, oh, that's Beadle's rods or that's, that's uh, Cy Beta's, like, buckets or that's... We kind of are, you know, because you would still sort of chat with each other about where your stuff is and be open to things. But I had bed chairs hidden because you don't want to be... You don't want to be doing a night over on the sort of fire high, high lagoon bank, for example, and and come all the way back round to the ski lake, ski lake bank to get a bed chair and all the way round because it might take an hour and you, you'd be cut to pieces. So it was handy to know how, exactly where you had stuff. But as time went on, I was getting more and more stuff stashed there all the time, including food. I'd dig holes and put, uh, put like especially tea bags and coffee and biscuits and stuff like that. Snap the lids on and. And, and put put the buckets in the hole and like, cover them over with mud and leaves and stuff like that. But you'd have to know exactly where they were stashed. And I, in my mind, it was like I had a diary in my mind of like, right, uh, spindly tree, uh, spindly tree swim, twenty paces that way, uh, fifteen paces that way. You're going into the forest now, and seven paces that way, I'd find an inflatable dinghy, you know, <laughs> that I'd stashed away. And then you get round to you know, say the point, and right. Uh, 20 paces that way and I'd write all these things in my diary so my diary was full of all sort of stuff that where I had stuff tucked tucked, tucked away and to keep in, like little tricks that you had as well to keep intruders away just in case so if I had something like say an aqua brolly that I didn't want to be nicked or something like that that I had all sort of camoed up and stuffed in the undergrowth if I didn't want anyone finding that I remember you know sort of six or seven yards away from it I'll get like bits of bog roll and I put it in the undergrowth, like and press it in, and put it in the undergrowth, and put it in there because it looked like someone had been in there to do, you know what, like and, and left the paperwork behind, and and you know with a thought that's like, oh, I ain't going to go any further in there, so they turn around. It was all like little tricks that you do, and you know even on the fishing front, you used to have these um, twig traps when you was fishing. So so I'd be fishing somewhere, and um, I wanted to know if anyone had come down the path during the night. I'd have like a couple of like twigs in the like sticks in the ground with like v shaped like rod rests if you like and one going across so if i was obviously all of us on there were paranoid about being caught so we'd have these like twig tracks traps set up and then if i'd done a night in say the south westerly point and you, in the morning at first light you'd go along there to see if they'd been sprung and it was amazing the amount of time that they'd been sprung because like anyone walking along there wouldn't have known they were there because there's so much foliage there and everything it's quite spooky really because like i think well hang on i've been sort of 10 yards 15 yards away from that twig trap and here we are like the next morning someone's gone through it and i'd never seen any deer there or anything like that there was obviously the old fox running around but i used to set the, the traps so they were quite high so it was all a bit weird really um so yeah where are we 2006 so in the spring of 2006 i got up there and uh it was it was really warm day but there was a a, a, new, a, a, a fresh northeasterly had blown right blown right into the corner in this little swim they should call the northeasterly swim because if there's northeasterly blowing in there it was a, and in the spring you know what it's like when there's a new fresh wind in the spring you want to get on the back of it, especially on a big pit like the Mere, because, you, know, it, it, you know, it really is a good sort of place to explore when there's a nice fresh wind. So anyway, I've got my kit and gone round there. And uh, I was looking before I went round there, I was in the beach and I just saw a head stick its nut out in front of the little northeast corner swim. And I thought, 
I just stayed there for another couple of minutes and then there was another one and I thought that's it I've got to get over there so I've gone round there got a bit of kit from the undergrowth a bit here and a bit there uh, it was late morning and I didn't know the area well enough in front of me. I knew it was a deep area of pit because almost in front of a swim called the Canopy, which is quite well documented in various books. So it's quite deep in front. And I thought, well, I'm just going to get a couple of zigs out there, you know. So I just chucked out two zig rigs, you know, with the B5 fluoro pop-ups on, just lit, you know, and bang, bang, put them out there, set the rods, got back and wait. I don't think I bumped into anyone. I did later that day. And they was only out probably an hour, hour and a half. I'd seen, by the way, after that, I'd seen a couple more shows. So I knew that I was like rubbing my hands because, you know, there was fly hatches going. I mean, the mirror is so rich. There was all these fly hatches going on. This fresh new wind blowing into my corner. Four or five shows. I thought, yeah, all of a sudden it's away and I'm in. And anyway, I'm playing this fish, landed it, got it in the net, looked in the net. Well, it looks familiar dumpy short common it's only the same common that was my first fish this previous year that I'd caught when I was with beetle from the turds only this time it was obviously it was prior to spawning and it had put on quite a lot of weight and it was 30 pound six so I thought well I was a bit disappointed it was a repeat but hey it's, it's a mere carp at the end of the day and um Mart uh, that, that's it I think I just got it in the net and the guy called Mad Martin was walking around who f was fishing the mere quite a lot he Martin would sort of like he'd fish it sort of quite covertly he would come along and he, he didn't live too far away so he could afford to come along bait up a few spots come back the next day look at the spots I couldn't do that from Somerset obviously and he'd come around to check a few of his spots and and I got this fish and I said oh any chance of a couple of pickies mate and he said yeah so we've taken a few pics and, and then put it back so off Martin's gone well done mate he said and all the rest of it and anyway um probably a couple hours later so I've got a fresh one out a couple hours later the other rod's gone couldn't believe it too like so I'm playing this other fish gets it in the net common again so my third uh, one to fourth capture from the mirror two of them I'd repeat one of them I'd repeated on caught twice obviously and it was about 25 pounds something like that but I was still chuffed you know what I mean I I just wanted to go through the you know um, the journey of just catching a few fish you know and, and, and feeling and having a taste for the mirror so that was 2006 and that session I remember uh, the next day it got really warm it was really hot the next day and Lee had phoned me and see my son to see how I was getting on and he said I was going to come down for a look around and I said well yeah mate yeah come on down like you know and we'll you know if you want a bit of lunch or he said no I'd, I'd love to look around you know so he's come down for the day he's got down that morning coming to my swim I've done us a brew and what have you and he said I'm going to go for a walk he went for a walk and funny enough it was only around not too far from there he got the tree and he come running back and said he'd seen the black mirror he was watching it and I'm like oh right okay but a couple a few others turned up I think Lee Lee Watson turned up then I don't know if Cy Beta turned up then but there was Beadle was a Beadle was about um anyway what so just the day was spent just having a good old social it was really nice and then Lee went back later on like early uh, late afternoon early evening and the la everyone kind of drifted off and um it was like that's it they started they started spawning they started sort of grouping up for spawning everyone thought are oh, they going to spawn so we'd all decided that obviously we, we don't want to fish for them when they're spawning so we stashed all the all the, all the gear away put it back in all the hidey spots but I had the luxury I was on the beach that night I had the luxury of a bed chair and a brolly which is rare on the good the beach was a good place to stash, stash stuff away behind the beach and I had a brolly and bed chair there anyway I'm fast asleep that night obviously I'm not fishing and I was awoken during the early hours just all this crashing badoosh crash crash and obviously they'd gone for it hammer and tongs spawning and I'm so it's still dark so I've got out I've got out the bag and I've gone around the corner just down the snaggy bank towards the spindly tree and sure enough they're just the water's just erupting in there so I thought oh so I yeah, it was a right decision for everyone not to fish so I've gone back into my bag got my head down for another couple of hours anyway at first light I've gone back there and uh I'm over the, this bow of the tree and what comes right underneath me swimming I mean I could have touched it, it was a black mirror absolutely fat as it went underneath you've seen the flat lobe of the tail as it went past and uh, a couple of other fish one or two sort of good sized commons 
And yeah, they were just going for it and spawning. And I remember sort of like putting my hand in the water under some roots of these, these, these trees and bringing it up, these willow roots. And it was just like strewn with eggs, like millions of eggs. And I thought, well, you know, I, I'm off back to Somerset the next day. And well, that day, sorry, should I say that morning, I was just waiting for the traffic to go in and go in. So I went and got a bucket and, you know, obviously that I had some eggs and took them back because I thought, no, I, I just want to. And that was the start of another story for perhaps another time. Um, so I left and went back to Somerset, left them to it that morning. And um, that was it until, oh, I suppose, yeah, I remember that it was it was June, mid-June it was, and I went back down there again, and I'd found uh, the Black Mirror with a couple of others up by a swim called the Spindly Tree. But what I found was getting up the trees and that, what I found that he was doing was actually coming in and dropping down, uh, and instead of like feeding on the bottom, it was, it was the, all the weed had sunk, all this sort of weed had sunk. So where it was about like eight or nine foot deep there, this weed had sunk to about four foot. And the fish were coming in, including the black mirror, and sort of like picking snails off the weeds. So they were using like the weed as the lake bed, if you like, the weed was the lake bed. And I remember going back to me Ashley days when that happened, and I sort of rigged up this rig that I got the I got the bait sort of I was using that weed as the lake bed, if you like. And I thought that's the best chance of me having a bite so far. You know, you know the black mirror was in and out all the time, and I watched it for a couple of hours. And there's one spot that it kept coming back to all the time. And lucky enough, there was a climbing tree right next to it as well. And it was only about 30 yards down from the spindly tree. So anyway, I'd, I'd gone back and you've got to improvise a little bit on the mirror because you can't take your full set of fishing gear that you would normally take. So I've gone into my tackle box and I rigged this up and rigged that up and I eventually got something sorted out that I was really happy with. Got a B5 pop-up on there, really sort of trimmed it down and testing it in the water until I got it to be like really critically balanced like that. Just sort of lie on the wind, on the weed, should I say. Um, anyway, when I was ready, got a PVA nugget on, sort of double hooked it through the hook and chest is on out the undergrowth. They was all hid away in, in the vicinity, walked down the margins to where I'd seen the black mirror and lobbed it out to exactly where I wanted the lead that I was using. It was almost like um, a running chod rig that I was using, if you like, whereas like, and I called it at the time, a parachute rig so that you're your sort of foam and your hook bait would like your lead would bomb through the weed but that would stay on top difficult to explain but anyway so i've chucked it out there right where i wanted it where i've seen the black mirror feeding come back down the margins with with my rod sort of quickly put it on 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 the buzzer just very quickly because i wanted to see that i had presentation and the before the foam melted so i've run down the bank sort of 20 30 yards to where that climbing tree was got up there and just as I've got like halfway up the tree I'm looking in the water and I could just see this like piece of white foam like hit the surface and I thought perfect so as I've looked down and I've got my Polaroids on I could just see my bait just sat on top of the weed I couldn't it couldn't have been any better so I'm up this tree it's like five four or five yards in front of me perfect presentation almost the exact spot where I'd seen the black mirror and a couple of others come in picking snails off so brilliant. So I've gone back down to my rod, set everything, put a load of branches like you do, you know, over the rod so that no one could see it because that spindly tree swim was right on the bird watchers bank where they come along. So um, anyway, I've, 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 that's that. And I got another rod round to the left and I'd hid that over and I was quite confident that nothing could be seen. I've been landing it a little bit further down. Nothing could be seen at all. Got, sat back in the undergrowth because obviously I'm on the bird watchers path right out of view and I never forget because I had little camo um, netting up as well so I had a camo netting I was on a little blow up bed a little single blow up bed it was only ones you get from the army shots on a little mat mats are only about an inch thick thick when you blow them up so I'm on that and I'm in there under the undergrowth and then I could hear that afternoon I heard some sort of twigs breaking and like someone was coming along and I thought oh you know so I sort of just laid there and it was Simon Bater and actually that was the first time I'd seen Simon at the mirror actually earlier I may have said he was there but I just recorded that because I remember thinking who is it who is it and I didn't I hadn't met Simon at that time but um it, but it was it and he, and he was looking out in the spindly tree and I thought he's gonna see me rods and he was looking out in the lake and sort of giving it he was there stood there for about 10 minutes and then he carried on walking 
And I thought that was brilliant, like really, because if, if the carp angler hasn't seen my rods, what chance have the bird watchers got when they're looking for like birds out in the lake? So like that gave me a real big confidence boost that I could stay where I was. Anyway, that night, that day passed no action and I decided to leave my baits in place. So I went down and to various locations in the undergrowth to get bits of food out to like cook something up, get something together. It, it was all rough stuff, but you know, it was stuff that could get you by till you went to the shops the next day and had like a half decent meal. So anyway, uh, that night nothing had happened. Got up in the morning at first light, took my little camo bucket out uh, up to the uh, where I sit in the spindly tree and I'm sort of sat on this bucket, you know, waiting for it and just getting light. And um, all of a sudden, um, Mad Martin comes along uh, to check his spots from a day, the day before that he baited. It's oh, any good, Mike? And I said, uh, no, nah, like, but, but, and I trusted Martin enough. I mean, those, you know, there was a lot of, although there was a lot of skullduggery, you knew who you could tell certain things, like people that you, and I was quite comfortable telling Martin that I'd seen the Black Mirror in the vicinity, knowing that he wouldn't be running down with a rod casting over me. You don't get that at the mere, because everyone, there was, a, you had, there was this like band of brothers, if you like, there was a lot of respect and eti etiquette. And um, anyway, um, Martin, he was, I was on the bucket and he was there for like, I think one hour turned into two hours, it turned into three hours and I was thinking, I was, I was really, I wanted to get up down the bank and climb this tree. But after, after about the sun had come up now, it was well up by now, it was about half past seven, eight o'clock in the morning, Martin said, oh, I'm off now to go and check his spots right down the bottom end. So I thought, oh, you know, no disrespect meant, but I, at least I'm, I, wanted, I wanted to be on my own, if you like, at that stage, because I knew that it'd been in the area and it was, this was my best chance of catching it. So I thought, as soon as Martin went, I thought, I'm just gonna go down the, I'm gonna go down and quickly climb the tree. So I've gone down there and I've climbed this tree and I've got to the top of the tree and it was a bit breezy that day and the tree was just wobbling a little bit. But as I've and I got my Polaroids on and as I looked down, I couldn't believe it. I'm looking down and sat right over my bait in exactly that spot was none other than the Black Mirror, just sat there over my bait. Well, I do remember that there was a lot of seagull feeding on the wing as well, coming in and swooping down. And as I'm up this tree thinking, oh, 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 oh I, I, you know, I better slowly get down from the tree. There was this massive eruption on the surface, like, <laughs> well, I thought one of the seagulls that had come in feeding on the wing had spooked it, spooked the black mirror. There was no mistaking it was that fish. I was watching it for sort of 30 seconds before it went. And, and I thought, one of, and there was this massive eruption, and I thought one of the seagulls I sort of spooked, and then all of a sudden, in the distance, you know, 30 yards down, I could just hear, beep, you know, this high pitch. And at that moment, I realized he'd picked up my bait and he, he was up. So I never, I don't remember getting down the tree. I probably just fell down and just, so I ran back to the bank, got into the my swim, and the reel was just in meltdown. The, you know, the spool was just in meltdown and I knew it was on the other end. So I pulled into it, um, yeah, and, and it just kept going and going, and because, you know, a fish of that, you know, you know how long the Black Mirror is, it's like a torpedo, and it's probably traveling at, at its greatest speed across the lake, going through all these weed beds, and I just couldn't stop it. It was just flat rodding me time and time again. I just, and because you don't want to be putting enough pressure on it that you, you, you know, the hook pull, I know you've got your stretch on the nylon, but it's just going and going and going and going. It must have done me, 70, 60, 70 yards out in the lake, and then it stopped. So, I and I think, well, at least it stopped. So, so I'm, I'm actually shouting Martin's name. Martin, you know, it was top of my voice, but he's probably long gone right down the bottom end by then, because I really could have had, needed some help at this stage. I thought, if he'd have stayed in a the swim, there's me thinking, I wish he'd go, because I want to be on my own. And I'm thinking, if he'd have stayed in a swim for an, for an extra sort of two minutes, he'd have been there when I had the bite. So anyway, I, I, so I tried coaxing it out, and now he's, he's too deep in there. So I then remembered that further down the bank, about 80 or 90 yards down, further down the bank in the upturned tree swim, that I had a fiberglass boat that's been there all winter. And I was hoping it was still gonna be there, obviously, because you never know. So I grabbed my chest waders, gone down there, and sure enough, the boat's there. And uh, so I quickly dragged it out, uh, I had a lock and chain on it around a tree and a little combi no, a little uh, yeah, combination number of that lock, I think it was, I knew the number, undone it, got, got the boat, dragged it down to the swim, got into the swim, chucked my landing net in there, uh, unlocking mat, you know, you know the, the works, and gone out there uh, and, 
Anyway, I've gone out probably 80, 90 yards and it's, I'm in this weed bed and um, it's, I'm picking weed off all the time. Then, then it's like travel to another weed bed and I'm picking that weed up. And eventually after it's sort of zigzagging me for probably 20 or 30 yards, and obviously I knew what fish it was by then, I'd got right on top of it. And I knew that it was right, right down underneath me. So I know from experience when you're landing fish from a boat, you can put as much pressure on you as you want from your rod. And sometimes it doesn't have any impact. But if you get hold of the line, you can pull it up like a baby. It comes up quite easy. So I'm now sort of like pulling it up and I'm thinking any, with any minute now, I'm going to be the captor of the Black Mirror. Do you know what I mean? I'm pulling it up. I'm thinking it felt really heavy, but I wasn't getting any pulls, you know? So I'm pulling it up. And as I'm pulling it up, I'm picking all this weed. There's like a big beach ball of weed coming off. And then all of a sudden I got to my lead core and I knew that I was using about quite a long length of lead core, about four or five foot of lead core because of that rig that I wanted, the parachute rig to present the bait on the weed. And I got to the lead core and I'm thinking, I'm still not feeling nothing. And then the weed was even more dense and I'm picking it up. And then all of a sudden I've picked the whole rig up and then I just saw my hook length going down with my hook had opened up and I was absolutely gutted. And it's like, you know, the most heartbreaking fish loss I've ever had in my life, you know? Um, so yeah, that was a story and that was, I think it was June the 16th, if I'm not wrong, 2006. So that was my first in close encounter with the Black Mirror, although I'd obviously seen it in the water, but yeah, you don't want to be going losing that fish. No. Yeah, not good at all. Sickening, I reckon. Yeah, it was. Yeah, not a nice feeling. Be <laughs> careful what you wish for. You said you wanted to go for all the blood, sweat and tears. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> obviously you hadn't had enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I guess. I, but I remember thinking to myself at that time that, in a, in, again, in a bit of a sadistic way, I, I, maybe, I wasn't glad that I lost it, don't get me wrong, but that was the first time from that point onwards that I'd done enough homework on the place, I'd been travelling backwards and forwards enough from long distance. At that point was the point where I felt to myself that actually... I felt, I honestly felt that I deserved to catch that fish. Having lost it, mm. that turned the corner for me because I felt, well, I've lost it now, so I think I deserve to catch it. For I think if I'd have caught it any time before then, I'd have thought, I haven't really gone through the mill enough and what have you. I mean, there have been one or two that have caught it really quickly, and that, that happens on any lake with any fish, you know. But most people go through blood, sweat and tears to catch that fish. And, uh, yeah, that was the point that I felt... Do you know what? From now on, I really feel like I deserve to catch this fish. <laughs> oh yeah, painful loss, mate. It's uh, it's never yeah. nice to lose a carp, but especially when it, you know exactly which one it is, and it's that one. So uh, I guess that just set it in stone even more that you had to make sure that you caught it one day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. You, you know, you don't want to be losing fish like that, and it was so frustrating because I'd done everything right leading up to the capture of it, tracked it down where it was feeding got the rig bang on, you know, was patient, you know, um, just a bit, yeah, it's frustrating, but that happens in it as carp fishing. We've all been through that. So, uh, so yeah, that was, uh, that, that, when, that was in June, 2006 and, uh, fished it a few times more than the rest of that year. Uh, again, I was still felt that I was learning about the place more than anything. You know what I mean? Just sort of going round, stashing, get, as, as, as the time went on, I was getting more and more stuff sort of stashed away. So you, the campaign was kind of picking up. And like with anything, the more practice makes perfect, if you like, the more, the more you, you, you're doing it, the more organised I was. I think by this time, I probably had about five bed chairs stashed around the place. I probably had three or four bivvies. I probably had two or three sort of inflatable boats. Some of it would go missing, mind you. You know what I mean? There was stuff that would, you know, there was... You know, it wasn't all plain sailing, do you know what I mean? It, it, you know, but that was the only way to fish it, really, because you couldn't keep coming on and off with gear. It was like then, anyway, uh, let alone how impenetrable it was. So I fished it a bit more that year, and then we move into uh, 2007. And, you know, I would still visit the mere in the winter, I might add, but it would more so for a recce, you know, a bit might be, uh, you know, might be a sort of cold Sunday, frosty morning, and it's worth a trip down there just for the day, just to keep in tune with the place. And 2007, it started to get, up until then, the, some of the guys I mentioned uh, on there, uh, you know, I've mentioned some of the names, uh, also Kenny Gates, I met on there once or twice, he was a nice guy. You know, everyone was like, 
like it was okay, but 2000 and the round about you run about to the end of 2006, 2007, it started to get a few what I call like undesirables on there that were, um, again, a, a, another guy that I should have mentioned earlier that I bumped in a few times, lovely guy, Wayne Dunn was, was doing a little bit on there, good angler Wayne, got on well with Wayne, but there was a few people now starting to take the piss a little bit and they were sort of bivvying up along the uh, ski lake bank uh, and leaving their bivvies there and going off to work. And it was like against the grain of, you know, the, the chit chat amongst the, you know, the guys that had been fishing it for a few years, didn't. So I, and then there was, an, uh, as a consequence of that, there was raids going on and it all got a little bit um, heavy. And I, I didn't really enjoy it during their times. There was, you know, one skullduggery is one thing, but there was things going on that, you know, there was more rubbish being left on the bank. You was finding loads of beer cans on the bird watching bank and rubbish and gas canisters when they're not being left by bird watchers. It, you know, it was, you know, I remember having chats with Alan Welsh about it and Wayne Dunn and a few of the other guys that were saying this is this is out yeah, this is out of order army gym uh nice guy phil from the uh, phil from cambridge and a few others and so i kind of backed off in 2007 i didn't really enjoy it on there and, and there was a few raids that took place and in a way that was quite a good thing because it, it stopped would be people from you know some of these didn't fish it because of that after that so i kind of like only fished it a handful of times at most in 2007 uh, during that time, I had from the rat hole, uh, I had a, a, another fish, which was a common, a 30 pound plus common, which would you believe it, was the same fish that I'd had from the turds, when I, the first fish I caught from the mere, and the little northeast corner swim. So I've now had like five carp from the mere, uh, one of them, a hat trick, like three, three occasions, you know. Um, so here I was like feeling a bit unlucky about that, having that same fish three times and, and lost the black mirror. So I'd had sort of uh, three, four, five, six bites, one fish three times, two different separate commons and, and the black mirror uh, I'd lost, obviously. So um, anyway, that was 2007 kind of was not much to talk about, really, because it kind of came and went and it was pretty, it wasn't nice on there. There was a few. So I'd come back in 2008 a little bit more determined, if you like, thinking, oh, you know, start afresh. And um, yeah, got up there. I, I could talk about every little session I went up there, but I'd keep you for hours. Really, we're trying to keep to the to the better sides of things. Or uh, one little story uh, before I go on to uh, uh, that led to the capture of the Black Mirror was that I was there. There was a few raids going on then as well. It was it was uh, when was it? The end of May, beginning of June, I think it was two two thousand and eight, uh, and. Uh, another guy that's just sprung to mind, Damper Dan from Kent. I mean, he had got done by the EA, uh, the doctor. I don't know if Lee Watson was the other, someone else it might have been Beagle. Not when sure. When you say they're getting done, what were they getting fines? Yeah, they were getting fines. They Big were getting because the dangerous place to fit t time to fish the mere was in the, what is the old closed season because it's a triple SI, you're not supposed to be on there. So, between it's crazy really because <laughs> there's no fishing on the mere, no legal fishing. But I believe that there's a bylaw where you can only get prosecuted by you know the environment, the EA, the environmental agency, between March the 14th and June the 16th. So that was the real danger time, and this was in that danger time. And there was three of them that got. I, yeah, I think they got fines. They they uh, that was about 90 quid from memory. Um, but they got fined. But it's like a smack on the back of the hand. But it, it increased as you went along. So if, like the next time you got done, you got done a few hundred quid and what have you. So anyway. I'll condense that bit, but I'd gone down there and I knew the raids were happening on a Saturday morning, uh, but I was on the southwesterly point and I'd done a couple of nights uh, in different parts of the lake, but I'd found the Black Mirror, you know, just out from the southwesterly point and I thought it was a Friday night and I knew the raids were taking place Saturday morning, but I didn't really want to go. So I so I put, I flicked the baits out in the margin and I had a little corn rig out and just fishing over a few grains of corn on a little clean, clear patch in the margin. Nothing happened through the night. So in the morning on that Saturday morning, I'm kind of like waiting for the, you know, looking around the lake, uh, you know, being quite vigilant because I knew that the last few Saturdays they'd raided it. And all of a sudden I'm in, I'm away. It's like a one noter. And I've come running out from the undergrowth, uh, pulled into it and, and, all of a sudden it's done bang 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 and this pike started tail walking out the water 
and it was a pipe must have gone over my little corn rig which was balanced and sort of like disturbed the corns and bang he snapped at it and whatever oh, it's just what I wanted to disturb the area was that so I've managed to get the pike up on the bank, got my little disgorges out and unhooked it and off he went. I thought, oh, just what I didn't want because I'd seen the black mirror uh, and two or three other fish in the area at the time. So um, anyway, with that, I'm, I'm looking across the other side and who have I seen walking around the other side? These two EA bailiffs. Well, you can tell they were because they was in like this green. You can tell the EA green. I, so I'm quickly scrambling. I'll, as I say, I'll condense it quite a bit, hid all my stuff in the undergrowth behind uh, went up the bank, got my bird, bo bird watcher's book out, and I'm up on the high bank studying the birds. You know, they've come along and said, oh, there was another guy that turned up, you know, was just walking around. And they said to me, are you fishing? I said, no. Uh, they walked down the high bank, found me st stuff in the undergrowth, because the problem is at the mirror, it's so overgrown that when you walk into the undergrowth, into the forest areas, you leave like trails. And anyway, they'd come back, they'd found my chest waders and then they'd found me old um, rucksack and the couple of bits and pieces that I had in there. And I had to put my hands up and say, yeah, OK, book me, Dano. You know, I've been done. Um, and that was that. So, you know, um, so that was another story for another time, if you like. But I, yeah, I got done. I actually didn't get fined and I was quite fortunate, really, because... I, I'd put a little skullduggery rumour around to a few people I knew within the industry that I got done 800 quid, this find 800 quid, because I thought if that gets round the grapevine, it'll stop other people getting there. And it worked a treat because Cartworld come out and the, edit and the editor of Cartworld at the time was a guy called Martin Ford. And he'd put this piece in there about, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he put, oh, and he didn't mention my name, probably for legal reasons, but he said, oh, one guy that I know. And he, to be fair, he was very nice about it. One guy that I got a lot of respect, well-known angler, got a lot of respect for, has just been caught fishing for an Amir and got fined 800 quid. Well, in a way, that was like, although I never, I got, the reason I got away with it is because they didn't actually catch me fishing. And I had to write to this adjudicator and explain that, i would come up with a story that I wasn't actually fishing. I was just walking around and I'd heard that you couldn't leave your kit there. So I put it in the undergrowth because I physically didn't get caught fishing as such. Whereas the others did because the EA Baelish come in when they had their rods out. I actually said that, you you know, that I, I was just walking around the place, but I wasn't fishing and I stashed it. And I was planning fishing like Raysbury 2. Uh, but I just had to put my stuff in the undergrowth. So that's why I got away with it. But I think that done me a favour because, you know, I was having loads of messages. Oh, sorry to hear you got done. That's a bit of a heavy fine, isn't it? When the other guys have only got done 90 quid, you know, but the old skullduggery, yeah, I know, like blah, blah, blah. Anyway, because I, because I got done, I had to keep a low profile for, for a while. So I didn't come back and for another, at least another month or so. So I'm back there in, in, in early July. And... I'm walking around um, that, yeah, I'm sort of forgetting little bits really that I should have mentioned the year before, but it's so difficult to remember it. Um, and I decide, yeah, there was a, there was a, it was a new moon phase, right? And the Black Mirror loved the new moon. You know, it was a different animal on the new moon. You know what I mean? It was nearly all of the captures. If you, I think it had been caught 19 times over the, since 92. So it wasn't, regardless of what people think it wasn't a frequent visitor to the bank if you look at some of the other fish how many times they caught during that time i think it had been caught about 18 maybe 17 18 or 19 times prior to my capture over that period of time which you know it wasn't a lot of captures really and um anyway this new moon phase come up and i thought i've got to get down there and i I went round and I thought, yeah, there was a nice new, uh, yeah, nice southerly wind that had sort of sprung up and low pressure. I thought, I've got to get myself in a rat hole. So I've gone over to the rat hole, um, got my little inflatable sort of blown up. And I thought, oh, you know, there's not many people about. I can just chance going out to the bars and plateaus that are about 80 yards in front of the, uh, front of the uh, rat hole swim. The rat hole, by the way, is right over the other side from the bird watchers bank. So I felt quite safe. Don't forget the last time I was there, I got, I got booked. So I felt quite safe over there. So I've, I've you know, there's no one around and I've, I've gone out there. And when I, as I've got out to these plateaus, there's a light breeze. I took a bucket, I had a bit of chopped B5 and a bit of corn and some chopped tigers with me that I was gonna put in. 
you know, on top of the bars and what have you. But as I've got there, I've just seen these dark shapes. One of them was really big. Well, they was all quite big, but one of them was massive. And I'm thinking, it's got to be the Black Mirror. But the, the light on the water with a little bit of chop, you couldn't make out. And the water was a bit milky. So I thought, I'm not even going to put any bait in. I'm just going to let the wind drift off of the spot because I knew they were there. And once the wind had took me sort of 20, 30 yards away, I turned it round, like went back to the bank. And I thought, right, I, that's where I got to go. So I've set up in the rat hole. I've gone right down to the point and got a bed chair from that area. I've gone down the, to the, the narrow end and got the, uh, uh, a brolly and stuff like that because I wanted to be a bit of comfort set up because I was over the safe side, if you like. And um, anyway, later that evening, uh, when it calmed down, I thought, I've got to get out in the boat. I've got to, I've got to get some little markers out there. Little, I used to use corks, little uh, wine bottle corks, you know, as markers. So I've rowed out there about 70, 80 yards and uh, it was all milked up. I took my little bucket of bait with me again. It was all milked up. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm, gonna, have to, I'm gonna have to get a bit of bait in. So I've put a, a little court marker there and a, lot, a bit over there. And I knew it was choddy there. I knew there was weed, but nothing was like horrendous. Do you know what I mean? It was, cause it was coming up onto the shallow. It was probably about seven, eight foot at that stage. Whereas 16 to 18 foot all, all the way around it. So um, I got a little bit of bait in, went back, got the rod sorted out put a couple of baits out there, bang, bang, right on the money, because I got my court markers out there. Um, anyway, got them all sorted out before dark, got back into the undergrowth for the night, into my little sort of camp, if you like, into the bushes and undergrowth. Nothing happened during the night. Come out in the morning, um, left, you know, just on a little bucket, if you like, sat on a little bucket, put the kettle on, had a brew. I just sat there thinking to myself, you know, they still got to be out there. Uh, and then all of a sudden, one of my rods, just an absolute melter, just right like, so I've come, I've got off my bucket, run, and as I've got to the rod, it stopped and dropped back down again. And I'm thinking, Jesus Christ, I've looked out there and I'm, no birds about or anything like that. So um, I thought, well, I was thinking that perhaps it was, it, it was coming back to me. So it's gone off and then, because it's dropped back, it's coming back towards me. So I've got to hit it. I mean, you know, because it would have done me anyway, presentation wise. So I've picked up the rod, wound down and like pulled into it, half hoping there would be like a solid, but no, 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 it's just a bit of chod just, uh, and this rig just come back. And I thought, well, it had to be like, um, Obviously, I, I put it down to a wicked liner, personally, that, you know, maybe a, a fish that had got his line caught around its peck. And when that happens, I've had it quite a few times, they spook and they, they run off and they, they carry the rig with it. And then, and then they drop it, obviously, as they're swimming off. And I felt that that's what happened. So anyway, that was that. And I thought, I don't know what to do, whether to sort of, yeah, they're obviously out there. So I've decided to sort of wind in and go for a bit of a walk around. It was a lovely sort of sunny day. No, it sort of, no, it wasn't. Tell a lie. That was the, that was the next day. It was really just remembered that, that I, I decided to go for a walk around. It was really drizzly and overcast and misty, and that's why. So I put my waterproofs on and I've walking down the uh, ski lake bank, which is where the bird watchers frequent. And um, I thought, you know what? Like when it's wet around the mirror, you don't get many bird watchers and the like because every, they all get, I know they wear waterproofs, but it's not a nice place to, to be. So we noticed that you get a lot less people walking around there when it's raining. And I, and I knew I had a little inflatable stashed over that side in the undergrowth. So I thought I'm going to go in and get it out and have a little bit of a mooch around in front of between, there's a swim called the upturned tree, which is a little bit along from the spindly tree. So I've got my inflatable sort of blown up on the foot pump and sort of got my uh, Podroids on and I had a little life jacket as well so I put that on and I've gone out there and I'm just having a mooch around around this upturned tree area about 20 30 40, 40 yards out probably and um, all of a sudden I'm sort of like something caught my eye up to the right and there's a big black shape coming coming straight towards me that familiar sort of shape that I've mentioned a few times like like a, a, a like a Polaris missiles so, and I'm thinking oh my god like and it was one of them times where you just wanted to be like lifted up beam me up Scott you just want to be out because I don't want to spook anything you know just like that and it's come towards me and it's the black mirror you know every you see every inch of it obviously and it's come the it, it, water's quite clear by that stage and it's I, I've actually just stayed dead still and it's cut my boat in half it's come so I've seen its head go under the boat seen the, the tail and the flat lobe on its tail sort of disappear and I sort of quickly turn around that way and its head's come out this side and just, waddle, and just disappeared, almost oblivious to me being there. 
maybe it thought I was a swan or well, you know, just didn't take any notice because I'm in its environment. And he just carried on going. And I was like, my heart, it was just such a wonderful experience to sort of witness that. But of course, I'm thinking that's at least 200 yards down from where I'm fishing in a rattle, you know, as, as the crow flies, if you like, at 150 yards at least. So, and he was going that way as well. He was going down towards the beach, down the other end of the lake. And I, but I knew it was a nomadic fish. The black mirror, everyone would tell you it's fish there. It's a very nomadic fish. It often used to, didn't used to like feeding in the edge too much. It did, it, get, it got into the edge at times, but it would often break, up, up, break away from its mates and just swim up and down the middle. There was always these two humps, almost like a dinosaur. And on hot days, just like that one that me and Lee visited in 1999, that first encounter I said, he would often sleep, ride quite high in the water with these two humps out. And you'd often see him, you've got the binoculars just going up and down the middle of the lake. And I'm thinking, well, he's a nomadic fish. So although I, was, I lost a lot of confidence because I'm fishing quite a long way away, I'm thinking perhaps he's just broke off from the rest of them and sort of like come back down. So yeah, I'm going to stick where I am. So anyway, I got back to the bank, put the inflatable round, decided that I'm going to stay in the rat hole, went round there, just got my rig sorted out and fresh rigs for the evening. Thought, right, I'll get a bit more bait out there. In the, so I've gone out in the middle, little inflatable, you know, sort of like this, with a little bucket of chopped B5 and a few tigers and a bit of corn and what have you all mixed in. And, I, and, and I've got out to the, and as I've got out to this like bar pla uh, plateau area, I, straight away I saw the twitchy fish that I've mentioned a few times, the twitchy mirror sort of take on, I, which is a fish I know swims with a black mirror. So I'm thinking, right, yeah, that, that'll do me. So I've got a little bit of bait out there near to me, caught markers, bang, 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 bang. I was happy with that, gone back to the bank. It was all quite stealthy to be fair. Obviously I'm in a boat, but it's, it's a really small. It's only about a sort of five foot little, I had a series of little inflatables, tiny little things, all camoed up and everything, camo covers. So I got back to the bank, gone out there, bang, bang, got the rig, got the baits on the money because the court markers are still there. Set the rods over the cliff edge that there is there from the uh, rat holes, like a cliff edge and I've got them down by the bot. Gone into the, uh, uh, getting dark. So I'd gone into the undergrowth, I've got some grub cooked up for the night and what have you, and got my head down. Nothing during the night, woke up in the morning, really all that sort of bad cloudy weather had passed. It was now a bright sunny morning. So I've gone out there and I thought, right, I'm gonna have a brew. Um, stuck the kettle on, got a cup of tea in my hands, just looking out across the water. Nice guy, Phil from Cambridgeshire, I know had turned up and was fishing down in the point at 150, 200 yards down the bank. Opposite me, somewhere in the undergrowth over there was Nick Pete, the doctor, was set up over there in the undergrowth. And so I thought, right, I know there was, there was, yeah, there was three of us on. So I'm sat there with his cup of tea and then all of a sudden, beep, there's like a single bleat. So I thought, like, I put my cup of tea. And, I, oh, and that single bleat then materialised into a, the one note of the proverbial one. Oh, he's off. And as I'm looking at the rod sort of going down over this cliff edge, I could see my line lifting from the water like this. So I've gone back, I've gone, jumped over the top, pulled into it. And yeah, straight away, you knew it was a bloody good fish. Do you know what I mean? It was like solid. It just sort of like, you know, that usual sort of like, you know, where your rod's sort of going like that. And he's probably taken sort of 8, 10, 15 yards of line on its initial run, then stopped and come back and then a little bit more. But it was very deliberate and very deep and very slow. I knew that there was a lot of deep water between me and me and the fish. So I needed to get them back off of that plateau because there was quite a bit of weed on there, well, patchy weed. So it's picked up quite a bit of weed from there and then come back down. And, and, and there was a few scary moments where it was on the plateau where it had locked up. I think, oh, bloody hell, like maybe for 30 seconds, you know, where I'm thinking, what am I going to do? Do I get out there in a boat? And then all of a sudden you'd get that ping, 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 ping. Oh, here we go. Ping, ping, ping. Oh, we're in again. And then it'd drift and then it'd lock up again. And, oh, here we go again. And I, so I had like, a two or three minutes of like scary moments and then he, I've gingerly coaxed him back over the bar and into the deeper water and once he's in that deeper water I know now that I'm okay for the time being so anyway um, I don't know 10 minutes have gone by I suppose and I've got him back to the in front of me and he's still staying deep and it's gin clear and I'm in I'm stood in I, I haven't I've got my chest waders on because I obviously didn't have time for all that I'm just stood in my water with my trousers on up up to about about me bollocks I suppose you know in water and but it's quite steep there and gin clear and it drops off to about 17 or 18 foot so 
you know, a couple more steps and I'd, I'd, you know, I'd have gone under, if you like. So I couldn't, I couldn't get going any further at this stage. Um, anyway, he's gone down the margin to my right and then he's gone to the left and he's really staying deep. And then all of a sudden, I've gained a little bit of line on him and he's now coming towards me. And you can imagine the picture of the scene, Joe, it's like gin clear water and, uh, and, and about 12 foot in front of me, the unforgettable, uh, you know, sight of the black mirror swimming along in front of me. And I could even see his boily. I could even see my boily just hanging out of his lip, right? You know, when I saw it. But he was towing this great big ball of weed that was about the size of a beach ball. And I'm thinking, I'm shitting myself because I'm thinking he's towing all that that big ball of weed. And as he's come past me, I saw, like his eye, I could see every. It was just perfect. It was like if I could just, I, I, just, I could relive really that moment, which I often do. And he swam past me, and he started going down to the left. And there's a big snag down to my left, about probably 20 yards down. And he's heading straight towards that with this big ball of weed. So he kept going and kept going and kept going. So I've got the rod down on it, and I had to put a bit of pressure on it at that stage because it was either that or he's in the snag and that was probably the scariest part of the scrap especially because I knew then that what fish it was my legs I've got to admit at that stage were like jelly I mean I could act, I've never had that before in my life but they were honestly I can't describe they they, they just felt like jelly and he's, he's trying to get into the snag and the rod's taking on this curve and he's like eat, 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 eat like that and, and, and I thought any minute now that hook's going to pull and I was, couldn't feel but thin, that, that boily hanging out his gob any minute now and luckily enough I just gained enough on it and it started coming my way and decided to go on another run anyway it was just going backwards and forwards in front of me probably another two or three times until it was eventually ready and I've just sort of slipped the net out and it was just please 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 and and, and just managed to get him into the net and then got that big ball of weed which is now kind of my side of the net and chucked it on top of it if you like just to get it all in there and just you know when you like you, you lift them arms clear of the water and you know it's yours you know when the the, the the old sort of drawstring comes up out of the water and yeah and it was like I've just looked in and I never forget sort of just going because I'm now waist deep in water sort of thing and just putting me hand in and like before I really, I, I knew obviously what fish it was from what I just described, but I just wanted to always just put my hand in them through the weed and I just felt his back and I, and, and I put in my book. It was like reading a carp through Braille, if you know, I mean, bl bl I was blind and I just like going along and I'm, yeah. And then I got to the tail, massive tail on it, and I could just feel that smooth black lobe, you know, where the tail goes down like that. And, I, and that was like, obviously it, like, you know. Um, so yeah, I got, I've, then got the black mirror in the net so I don't know I mean yeah I was I felt emotional and you know uh, all the things that all the you know everything that I all the effort that I put in when I lost it when I, I've been done for uh, you know by EA for being on there or at least booked anyway um, a few little run-ins here and there various things and I just thought at that stage you know what even if I say it myself I think that I really deserve to catch that fish by that stage which that's all I wanted to say when I caught that, caught that fish was like, wow, I, I kind of actually deserved it, you know. And um, yeah, I was absolutely over the moon. So I phoned home straight away um, and spoke to the family. And my son said to me, Lee said to me, right, that's it. I'm coming down. I said, like, what? He said, I'm driving down there. I said, mate, it's 320 mark. No, no, me and Rose are coming down. Phoned up, you know, spoke to my daughter. Dad, you know, uh, Kelly, you know, she said, oh, I'm... I'm coming down with Dean and unbelievable, they both on their own separate vehicles come all that way. So we, we got the fish in. I then phoned a nice guy, uh, Phil, down in the point. I couldn't get hold of the doctor. He was oblivious to everything. You know, I, I kept looking at across there and I couldn't see where he was. Anyway, me and nice guy, Phil, have got it up on the bank and, you know, he's helped me get it out of the water, zero the scales, weigh it and everything. And it was 52.10 and then we've put it into a sack and, you know, secured it up for an hour or two until everyone arrived. And that's the story, yeah, of the capture of the Black Mirror. And it was just, you know, my children arrived and that leads me to that famous picture of the four of us, five, one to five of us around the fish, me in the middle and my son and daughter and their partners either side just looking down at it. And yeah, and that was, that was the end of the, the Black Mirror journey for me. And um, yeah, it was just, and uh, I, I can't, there's so many people I'd love to thank for that capture, Joe, but um, you'll be here all day if I wanted to do that, you know? Yeah, yeah so, um, 
obviously it was great for Lee and Kelly and their partners to come down. Uh, the other person who I should make mention of, who was massive help, was Dave Gorfon, uh, a, a friend of mine for many, many years, um, who was actually fishing on the opening night of Frampton when I caught the Black Mirror. Uh, and as soon as I phoned him up and told him what had happened, yep, I'm coming straight down there and there's no one else I'd prefer to have behind the camera than Dave. So I got to give special thanks to Dave as well. I mean, obviously I've mentioned my kids traveling down and their partners on that 320 mile round trip, but yeah, Dave was an absolute diamond as well. So yeah, I've got to put a special mention in for Dave. Yeah, all the good. Oh, he took some absolute stunners, mate. You know, some absolute stunners and he put his heart and soul into it. So I'll always be grateful for that one, Dave. And um, yeah, thank you, mate. So um, yeah, thanks very much. Yo, yo, yo. All right, people, how do you fancy winning a St. Ives Eight Lake season ticket? Now, this is something you can't even buy because there's a waiting list at the moment. So, yeah, we've got one to give away. Massive thanks to Gordy for uh, contributing this prize to us. It's worth £600, so it's a high-value prize, and like I say, it is an absolutely awesome complex. Probably my favourite complex in the country that I've fished so far. Loads of big fish to go at, loads of water. Um, like I say, Gordy's a really nice guy who runs it and all the anglers around there, very friendly bunch of people. Um, nice social that goes on there. Some of the lakes have got barbecues in nearly every swim. <laughs> so you don't even have to take your own barbecue. Um, but yeah, if you fancy winning yourselves one of them tickets, all you've got to do is get yourself a gold card subscription um, this month, which costs $7.99. We'll be doing the draw at the beginning of March. so. Between now and then, anyone who's got a gold card subscription will go into that draw. Even if you only want to go into the draw and then cancel it afterwards, you can cancel these subscriptions anytime you like, just at the click of a couple of buttons. So that's a real simple process. And uh, yeah, hopefully you don't want it. Hopefully you'll continue subscription. But as I said, you know, if you did fancy getting into a draw with pretty good chances, the old odds and that, compared to some of these other draws out there, then uh, get yourself a gold card membership at carpankle.tv. Thanks for watching, big up yourselves, easy now. Okay Tim, we've talked a little bit in the past about, you know, why fishing can be good for our mental health. Um, but at the same time, I think it's probably important to also, you know, kind of highlight the fact that it's not necessarily gonna fix your problem. <laughs> you know, and sometimes going out for days on end when you've got a lot of issues going on, um, and just ignoring them and distracting yourself from them isn't actually going to get to the root of them. So I guess it's a case of, you know, um, being aware of that mm. and recognising um, the problems that are arising and, and, you know, trying to sort of get to the, the root of them rather than just trying to dull down the symptoms, the effects that it's having on you. Yeah, I, th I completely relate to that. I think, um, you know, the, the nature of problems is that, that they tend to remain problematic until there are solutions or there are alternative options and um, you know, I've been very guilty of it in the past that if you ignore problems and hope for the best and go away and occupy yourself doing something else that those things either remain and you've got to come back to them or worst case they get worse while you're away and I think you know in the context of fishing I can see that you know if, if, if it's really legitimate to get out for a few hours or for a day, to get away and distract yourself, absolutely go for that. But I think what we can explore right now is, is what does someone do in a situation where they find themselves constantly getting away to distract from something, but they're no clearer on how you go after the causes of the, the stress or the problem in the first place. Um, so I'm not here to ever suggest that anything's necessarily right or wrong, but just you know share some insight and. and provide some options and I think in improving people's mental health is, is always still about generating options and so if you came out for the day knowing that there is a thing that you're definitely walking away from for 12 hours but when you get back that's the thing you're going after it's useful to know how to go after that stuff and I think quite often I said it in a previous episode that the source of uh, what makes us feel rubbish or that does impact our mental health or source of those problems are often quite practical in nature like there's a bill you need to pay there's a thing you need to fix there's a, a conversation you need to have with someone those types of things does that mm. make sense 
Would you, do you think that one of the main causes for sort of unhappiness and stress in life is where people are doing something that they don't actually enjoy? Because I guess, you know, our working lives are a huge part of our lives, aren't they? It's a lot of the, the yeah. time that, you, that we have uh, on this planet is spent working, isn't it? And if you're ultimately doing something that makes you unhappy, then the only way of actually fixing that problem is to make a change, isn't it? Yeah, I've, I've always been very guilty of, of putting too much emphasis on doing things I feel I should be doing, not necessarily I want to be doing. And I think, um, you know, back on, on a good few wasted years where I was, you know, struggling mentally and I was taking myself too seriously, that I wasn't wasn't creating the opportunities to, uh, to do things that, that made me happy or, or us happy. Um, we touched beforehand on this idea of of consciously trying to stay in alignment with the sense of identity, who you are, doing the things you enjoy, and this is great, great one liner I, I always come back to, which is you know you can't you can't do great work unless you love what you do, and and people doing a good job in whatever role they have, you know makes them feel good, fulfilled, satisfied, um, sometimes you know happy with you know how they're showing up in the world. Um, if you're in the wrong job, you're out of alignment, you're having a rubbish time, you don't like your boss, all that sort of stuff, you know, it's very unlikely that a sort of strategy for 20, 30 years of just getting away from stuff as much as you can is really going to work. Mm. Um, and, um, and, and quite often people need big prompts to realise there is something in their life, which is not necessarily their job, that, that is not serving them. And, and, you know, ultimately is not making them happy. So, um, of course, it's a great thing to create that time and space, give yourself permission to get away and, and fish, etc. But as you say, sometimes you need to go back and address the root cause of the thing that's causing the problem in the first place. Um, and my work's really about, you know, offering these prompts and generating options for people to help them identify that if there is something like a source of stress, we call it, that's showing up for them and causing problems, often compounding problems and suffering, um, uh, causing poor mental health, you know, or stress, that you just have a, a simple way of identifying what that thing is and, and you generate the belief that you can go after it. You can't solve all problems, but you can, you can address things, you can get them done, you can find peace with that situation, whatever it might be. So I just encourage people to go and identify, if there is a thing, what part of your life is it coming from? Is it your work? Is it your relationships? Um, is it your physical health? You know, is it your financial health? And, and we know that a financial insecurity is one of the biggest things mm. for people. It, it causes all sorts of um, you know, unhelpful you know, thinking and avoidance behavior beyond the problem itself. You know, I used to be a nightmare for that. You know, if there's a mounting credit card bill, just ignore it. Um, delete the email and hope for the best now, that's never worked <laughs> it's not going to work <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean it's it's hard to implement change into your life isn't it you know yeah. and that old saying you know old dog new tricks and all that but i always think of my father you know because he was 17 years on the building site being yeah. a carpenter and then when he was 37 he was like right, i'm not happy in doing this anymore mm. and even though they you know he had three children with my mum um and mum was on a you know student's nurse wage or you know quite a basic nurse's wage uh he took himself out of that situation back to university trained to be an english teacher became an english teacher and absolutely loved doing it you know and uh yeah it must have been a hell of a risk factor and obviously they did struggle you know it was financial side of things was hard for them but ultimately, he'd done what he wanted to do and it made him happier and he was very good at it as well, you know, like the, the pupils loved him, you know. Um, and he would have got a load of other benefits from that new role that he probably wouldn't have got from his previous job, but they would have been different. Yeah. And he's experienced life in a different way. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So I've always think, well, it's never too late to make a new start, you know. Yeah, I think... Um, you know, naturally, as you say, change is quite difficult, particularly a massive change like that, in that people, sometimes they don't believe that people like me can do things like that. Um, or it just seems like an overwhelming task to retrain or to get the knowledge you need to be confident in doing something. Um, 
you know, I, I'm one of those people that has sort of got to 43 without necessarily applying for many jobs. So, um, you know, if there was a situation where someone said, right, you know, you need to do something different and you need to, you know, retrain and get a CV out there, you know, I know that that will be a thing for me because I have to start thinking in a different way to present myself differently to a different market. So, so all of those things are really different. That's very difficult for people if they're considering bigger changes. But um, as you say, your dad's example, like often it's it's a really liberating thing for people. Um, and um, you know, I know plenty of people who have you know, left have been soldiers, army officers, and, and become um, you know primary school teachers, um, gardeners, DIYers, you know, whatever it is, and people find happiness in those new experiences. I think um, we talked about alignment, but there's this other idea in, around risk and protective factors that's important to understand. And you know, we're, we're all um, unique and different in our own life circumstances, but what we all have are two sets of variables. So we have a set of risk factors, you know, the things that um, risk positive mental health, um, an extension of this idea of problems and then protective factors. And protective factors are often those things that um, we just happen to have in our life, like you, know, you live in a safe place, that would be a good one. Um, but we also can deliberately build them into our life, like go fishing, go play golf, you know, those things that we know benefit us. Mm. But if, if we can encourage people to have a rough general awareness of what those risk factors are um, and which ones cause problems, um, and what their protective factors are. You know, that, that raised level of consciousness, arguably it helps people um, influence their mental health more directly, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for uh, inviting me up here, mate. It's granite, that's what we've been saying. It's been the granite, granite time. Well, we're here. We still try, don't we? We're going to give it a go. You've <laughs> got to push that barrow around the lake to keep your back, keep your back fit. All <laughs> oh, right, thanks, mate. I remember he handed me this rod one day and I didn't know what I was doing. You know when you're a kid and you're just reeling it right into the end? So basically, I beached a 25-pound croc. I think you had to be 16 to go out there. I was nine years old, out at Grafham in April, and I moved away from that kind of life. I lived on a boat uh, for six months, and I started river fishing straight off the back of the boat. And there we go. There's my prize from last night. But there, Joe, a cool one from Lake 8. The universe provided, didn't it? Indeed. Ask and you shall receive. So that's why I had to do the naked run around the lake. <laughs> I'm going to drown again. <laughs> <laughs>